You are listening to Packers Talk Radio Network. PackersTalk.com With the 21st pick in the 2014 NFL Draft, the Green Bay Packers select Haha Clinton Dix. It's time for the Packers War Room Podcast. Made me a believer into really thinking that the Packers really could run the table. And that was when I said right away, they're winning the NFC North. The bad majority Nelson was just a moment that I'll never forget. For him to be able to get behind the corner and, and, and really just catch the prayer, essentially, was just quintessential um, Packers 2016. Like I said, for this team to win two playoff games was... Uh, just astounding with how beat up they were and, and the the state of their defense, really. And now, alongside Jacob Westendorf and Cody Bauer, here's your host of the Packers War Room Podcast, Ross Uglum. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Packers War Room Offseason Podcast. I am your host, Ross Uglum. I'm a writer at Cheesehead TV and PackersTalk.com. And not joining us, as always, this week is Jacob Westendorf. Jake has uh, other uh, liabilities right now, and we are pleased to welcome also from Cheesehead TV, Zach Jacobson. Zach, how's it going tonight? Pretty uh, good. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me on, Ross. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Zach, another contributor over at, at Cheesehead TV and somebody whose work we certainly appreciate. And then... Uh, actually joining us, as always, is Cody Bauer, Cheesehead TV's resident draft expert. Cody, how's it hanging this Wednesday evening? It's going pretty good, man. Uh, looking forward to talking quarterbacks this week. Yeah, certainly a, a big position of, of need, or at least uh, something that last season appeared to be a position of need. We'll kind of talk about that as we go. Uh, something that's been somewhat addressed through um, free agency, actually street free agency, because of the release of Devon House. Uh, but, but, but speaking of some street free agents, Ricky Jean-Francois and Byron Bell were in uh, for visits today. And as of now, neither of them has been signed. Jean-Francois was a, you know, kind of a 3-4 defensive end, maybe could play a little bit of nose, but just a, a, a versatile guy who has some... Um, experience in even and odd fronts, a guy that Green Bay had showed interest in before he originally signed with the Indianapolis Colts. And then uh, Byron Bell was, you know, kind of notoriously a pretty bad left tackle, uh, I, I believe maybe even during Carolina's Super Bowl season, and then moved to Tennessee, uh, played kind of all over the line and found a little bit more success. Any interest in either of these guys, Zach? Well, Ricky uh, Jean-Francois more so than Byron Bell. I mean, Francois, he's missed six games since 2010. He's pretty much the epitome of, of, of a durable defensive lineman. And he's definitely someone the Packers could use to fill in that void that was left by B.J. Raji a year ago. And if the Packers do pursue Jean-Francois and bring him into Green Bay and you know the talks extend beyond his visit, I wouldn't be surprised if that spells bad news for Latroy Guyon, who is suspended for the first four games of the 2017 campaign. So we'll see how that turns out. Byron Bell, I mean, he missed all of 2016. I believe it was with a leg injury. Uh, he, he's played both right, left tackle and right tackle, but he also played some, some left guard uh, with the Titans in 2015. So it'd be interesting if the Packers bring him in and try to work him into more of a, a versatile role on the defensive line. But... Jean-Francois definitely is, a, in my eyes, more of a higher priority above uh, Byron Bell. Cody, what are your thoughts? I, the price is right. I wouldn't mind signing either of those guys. I mean, uh, veteran, you know, maybe incentive deals, just to try to get them in the camp. Uh, I bet my bottom dollar that Byron Bell is better than Don Barclay right now. And Barclay <laughs> just signed a one-point-something million-dollar contract with us. So I like Bell. Um, you guys mentioned the transition to guard. You know, we could use some interior interior depth with J.C. Treader and T.J. Lang both uh, departing the free agency. I wouldn't mind a veteran guy as opposed to relying on a rookie. Um, the offensive line class is pretty weak this year. There are some good interior guys up top, but depth-wise, you're not going to find a plug-and-play guy in the middle of rounds this year. 
as far as Ricky Jean Francois, I, I always liked his game. Uh, not only is he durable, he's just a solid player. He's not going to flash a ton on the screen for you, but he's going to uh, understand how to two gap and play within the scheme. Uh, I think he'd be a, a nice body to bring in as well. And, and if you don't sign these guys to a lot of guaranteed money, cutting them isn't the worst thing. You're still at $25 million to play with. It'd be great to uh, kind of pepper the roster with some veterans uh, so you don't have to bank on, on rookies uh, you know, right away or, or best case scenario, you, know, you hit on some rookies and, and these guys can go away for uh, dirt cheap. So I, I wouldn't mind bringing either of them in. All right, one guy that did take a visit today that actually did resign was last year's uh, ex- part of last year's experiment at running back Christian Michael. Michael, a guy that was exciting and frustrating at the same time, um, gave the Packers probably their most exciting run of the season um, with his kind of bowling ball full of knives act against the Bears, but at the same time had the the, the play that I I vined earlier. Of, of his performance against um, Seattle where he, you know, ran the wrong way. And that's just stuff that you can't have. Um, Aaron Rodgers is a very demanding quarterback. As far as everybody being on the same page has absolutely no time for wasted plays. And, and that certainly was one. Cody, what are your thoughts on Michael's talent? I mean, we're not, he's not exactly a rookie, um, but, but there's still maybe some potential there that's untapped. Sure, the Christine Michael truthers are still alive and well right now. I, I think, well, you know, I think the opti- optimist would say that, you know, with the full season, off season, you know, heading the playbook, uh, kind of doing the no pass protection schemes, I think McCarthy and Rodgers have learned, learned to trust him a little bit more. Oftentimes when he was in the game, it was, you know, more of a, uh, they're going to give it to Niles because that's pretty much all he knew. Uh, and similar to, uh, you know, the other guys we we sprinkled into the offense, you know, in short, limited spots. So, you know, I, I hope to, you know, see some improvement as far as the knowledgeable side. The talent has always been there. Uh, if he hangs out to the football and stays healthy, I mean, and going back to his Kansas City days, he was always buried behind Jamal Charles. Uh, you know, here he's going to have a good opportunity to compete with Ty and Ty Montgomery for carries, and it could turn into a, be a pretty good one-two punch, honestly. Uh, but you know, there's been so much disappointment with Niles Davis of, you know, showing you flashes of what he can be and never staying there consistently. So I don't think Packer fans should hold their breath. But, you know, if you want to be an optimist, there's certainly some good things that you could, you could say about him going into this year. Zach, what are your thoughts on Christian Michael? I actually uh, wrote the story about him on Ch- Cheesehead TV a couple hours ago, soon after the news broke. Uh, I love the re-signing. I mean, it, it's kind of like the Packers needed it. They only had Ty Montgomery and Don Jackson on the roster in the backfield. So, you know, bringing back Michael, he, he brought a, a very, uh, how's the word, the energetic burst out of the backfield last season. You know, at first we thought we were getting kind of a repeat of what Niles Davis was, Niles, Niles Davis, sorry, in uh, October. You know, a month later we bring in Christine Michael he was a carry for four yards in his debut against the Eagles. I believe nine carries for 19 yards the next week. And then that game against the Bears, he broke out. He had a pretty good game against his uh, ex-Seattle team. So I, I like the signing. It's very good depth, and it'll be very inter- interesting to uh, see what Michael can do with a full offseason under his belt. All right. Yeah, uh, one other guy that we need to talk about before we – Hey, I say earlier that he was buried behind Jamal Charles. I meant in the muddy backfield of Seattle. My bad. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Uh, one guy that we need to talk about also uh, is Jonathan Hankins. Really tall defensive tackle, played in a 4-3 scheme with the Giants. And I've just heard a little bit of buzz about Hankins, and that's a guy I really think um, could fit in Green Bay. I think that, you know, potentially, even though he played in a 4-3 scheme uh, at Ohio State, still could have been a better fit um, in Green Bay just because of his ability to uh, kind of play that nose position and really plug up the middle at 6'2", 320, has a, you know, a little bit more uh, height to him than like a Christian Ringo, sort of a, almost a Ricky Jean-Francois clone, but just a younger player. So Hankins is a guy I, I wouldn't mind seeing in Green Bay either. Cody, he's probably somebody – that you uh, uh, scouted, you were probably in the business at that point. Did, did what were your pre-draft thoughts on Jonathan Hankins? I actually like 
like Tankins quite a bit coming out. I think in the second round, uh, he's been a, a damn good player for the Giants. In, in college, you saw a really star run defender. That's definitely translated to the pro level. Uh, he's not going to get a, a ton of sacks, but he's somebody who can push the, push the pocket some in the middle. Um, speaking of the middle, if you look at his middle section, it's pretty thick and round. I, I think he could probably be a more explosive player if he took care of his body better. But, you know, right now we're kind of past the the charge of free agency. So now you're going to see some guys lingering around that maybe will come a little bit cheaper than what they anticipated or maybe sign some short-term deals where they have a chance to prove themselves again to to kind of get themselves into the, the market that's real hot for them. So I think if he wanted to come in and uh, do something $8 million-ish or you know, hopefully a little less than that, I think that would be a great addition to the D-line that can really help out the inside linebackers and sure up the run game as a whole. He's a good player who can two gap, and I uh, and again I think he could even be left out there on certain uh, packages of nickel if he has the pass. Just potentially a guy looking to reestablish his value. Zach, what are your thoughts on Hankins? I'll be honest with you, Ross. I did not know the Packers were looking into Hankins until Jersey Al brought him up to me uh, earlier today. I, I don't know much about Hankins' backstory aside from the fact he was with the Giants and he plays defensive tackle. So. He, he's a defensive lineman. He's a big dude. So all I can say to that is pull the trigger, Ted. Bring him in. See what he can do. I mean, what's especially if, like Cody said, he's hanging around, lingering for cheap. You know, what, what, do, you, what do you have to lose at this point? You got a, over $23 million, $25 million to spend. A lot of that's going to be rolled over to next season. Just see what you can get out of this guy. Add some depth to the defensive line. Yeah, I think they have to. I mean, I, I just think they – I would like to see a veteran take the um, – Penal position on the defensive line, and then uh, if if everything works out and Lowry and Clark are everything that we you know had always dreamed and hoped that they would be, then you get yourself in a situation where you can uh, utilize that player in the Troy Guyon's role as well, and, and maybe get rid of Guyon. I, I, I mean, it's not that much wrong with him as a player. But uh, just doesn't yeah. seem like a dude that you really want to be around your program for as long as Green Bay has insisted to keep him around. So I'm, I'm kind of in it for that penal guy on replacement that, that I believe would be a good idea. So whether it's RJF or, or Jonathan Hankins, definitely something I'd be more than willing to consider. Uh, at, this, at, at this point, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Cody. We talked about the D-line, too, a, a couple episodes ago where it's just not good at all this year in the NFL draft. I mean, you have maybe a, a, a guy or two at the top, but you're looking for depth of, of guys who can come in and help right away. I, I don't know how many you're going to really find. It's a, it's a weak class overall in the D-line, so bringing in a veteran wouldn't be a bad move at all. Yeah, there are a couple of run pluggers that I think, um, you know, I, I just ranked low because – and I, I like, like Cody said, I mean, I'm doing defensive line for the draft guy this year. It's already done and handed in. It's just guys that don't really, in my opinion, ever project to affect the passing game. And it's so hard to rank a defensive lineman high if you don't think he can play against the pass. Even if he's, you know, like I, I was super high on Jerron Reed last year uh, out of Alabama because I, I just never saw pass rush p- potential in his game, and that's a, it's a real problem the way that, that this league plays football. Speaking of being a real problem with the way this league plays football, Adrian Peterson, can we all just agree that I'm, 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 let me pose this question to you. Do you want Adrian Peterson on the Packers at the league minimum? I, I, I can't imagine he'd sign for it, but it, would it be worth it? No. I would not be in favor of that, no. See, that's that's where I'm at. I mean, yes. I mean, I, I may be a little bit different than you guys just because I'm, I'm not sure that they run as much of their running game out of the shotgun. But they do run a lot of their offense out of the shotgun. And he's a bad pass protector. And he's not a particularly skilled receiver either. I, I think you'd be pretty much – you'd be pretty much telegraphing what you're going to do if he's in the game. Now, granted, that could open some things up in the play-action game. But at the same time, I just don't see the value uh, in the roster spot. You know he's not going to play specials. I mean, that that's just – it's an absolute given. Uh, it's, it's not even on the table. 
So the, that roster spot, I think if, if you're just going to use Adrian Peterson as an in-between-the-tackles runner uh, and somebody at the goal line, you might as well just take somebody in the draft. I mean, you can absolutely get that in, like, round five. It happens all the time. Um, the Bears just hit it last year. Now they have Jordan Howard. It, it's, it's just a position that does not have a ton of value. And the idea, the concept of a lead back or a lead runner is – is it's just not a part of today's NFL, and and it's not it shouldn't be something that's super high up on on Green Bay's uh, on Green Bay's list, and I don't think it will be. I mean, I think that they'll draft a guy certainly to compete with, um, or really to compete with Michael to compete with um, uh, Don Jackson. That there will be another back brought in, um, you know, potentially. You know, John Crockett's still certainly available. That's a guy that's been around. Wouldn't mind them bringing him back as well. He, I know he's looking for a opportunity to compete, but I, I just don't think that that Peterson is worth the trouble. And, and you guys certainly seem uh, you guys certainly seem to agree with that. Uh, let's talk about the cornerbacks, which is the the position that we are taking care of today. But first, let's actually speak to the cornerbacks currently on the roster, uh, Zach. Explain to us, before we really get into this, kind of where you were, uh, different from everybody else, going into the season, talking about the cornerbacks. Because I know you had a level of concern about this position group that was not widely shared. Right, and I was uh, I was really... Uh, the, 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 the concern about the cornerbacks that I shared, as you said, wasn't really shared amongst a lot of other Packer fans who felt very strongly about how deep they were at cornerback and how talented they were. I mean, you had Sam Shields, the Marius Randall, Quentin Rollins, and really nobody outside of that. You had some undrafted guys. You, there wasn't a lot of talent there. And how that wasn't a red flag to anybody is is beyond me. But I, I, I said repeatedly last offseason, that group was one injury away from being in complete shambles. And soon... Behold, week one, Sam Shields suffers his fifth reported concussion. He's gone for the season. He's on IR. So, I, you know, you see how that ended up, and you see how, how one injury can vastly impact an entire group. We saw it with Jordy Nelson the year before, how that impacted the wide receivers. And it's just, it, it was just a mess. I never I never liked tooting my own horn about that because that's, that's, you know, that's, that's just annoying. But, I mean, come on. You, you had to see that coming. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was one of those that didn't see it coming just because I really thought and still think that Ladarius Gunter is a good fourth corner. Um, oh, yeah, me too. I think that what ended up happening, it was just the wrong guy. Uh, Sam was the one guy they couldn't lose. And, and I'm not saying that you're wrong because obviously you were right. I mean, it's been proven out. But I think that if it would have been like if Randall would have blown out his knee, I think you could have figured it out with, Rollins, Shields, Gunter, Hawkins, whatever. But the fact that it was Sam, it was the number one corner, and they absolutely did not have a number one corner ready to go was a, a huge issue. And, and so I think that's a, that's a real problem and something that was borne out on tape. But what I will say is that I really expect either Rollins or Randall or both to kind of have their Devontae Adams seasons this next year. Mm-hmm. Um, both guys were injured. Um, both guys had to play because of the lack of depth. I think, you know, if, if McCarthy would have had his way, I think it's very possible that there are guys on that, um, you know, on, on that roster that would have played and he would have sat Rollins and Randall to try and actually get them back up to 100%. Because you can crush a guy's confidence and we'll see what happens because, you know, Devontae Adams played on a bum ankle because of the lack of, receiver depth when Nelson went out and he had an awful year and he came back last year was 17th in defense yards adjusted above average he was three yards away from a thousand yard season he's tied for second in the league in touchdown catches I mean he had a great year and if Rollins and Randall can even get back to where they were as rookies but if they take you know a 10 or 15 percent jump in production over what they did their rookie season that will be an incredible jump from the production of their sophomore years. I mean, it would be truly, truly remarkable 
and something that would you know be team changing and, and I really do mean that so I I think what I would say is I probably have a higher opinion of the cornerback group going into next season than most because I do like the Devon House signing and because I really do think that you're going to get above average starter play from either Randall or Rollins. Cody, what are your thoughts? I still think they're missing the number one corner and uh, for as good as you can try to piecemeal our guys now, unless they do take those big steps that we're kind of hoping. And, you know, Joe Witt's a good coach. He gets a lot of credit, I, I think, deservedly. He needs to get those guys both back on track, whether it's their injuries or what. But um, one of them either needs to develop or you have to go, you know, maybe get lucky in the draft, just something along those lines. Otherwise, I think you can still see some issues. Um just too much inconsistent play from those guys to think that uh, a light's going to oh, a light's going to turn on for them. Uh, it's been two years now since we saw them, so you know saw them actually play well. I think it's wishful thinking that they're going to return to form. It's what us as Packer fans are hoping for. Uh, we trust that Ted scoured them well enough, and that we've seen enough from them that they can figure it back out. But it's a lot to ask uh, from both two of those guys. So. Uh, it'd be ideal if one of them stepped up because I don't think you're going to find one at 29 or, or later. Well, I mean, they, they it hasn't been two full seasons. It's just been one bad season and one good one. Sure. So we're, well, we're going to be two seasons. It's going to be not last season, the season before since they've played well. So we'll be entering, you know, essentially into their second year of not playing. You know, I guess I'm saying it awkwardly, but... They need to return to their form as rookies, or like you said, possibly even better. One of them needs to step up and, and try to take over that number one role. A guy that you could put on Julio and Odell and make it to the playoffs where you're not gritting your teeth every time they try to throw it at them. Um, and, and, and House is going to help with that, but we know what kind of House is too. So is he going to be the lockdown guy? Probably not. He's not going to be paid like one. If one of those guys needs to step up, we've got to try to find one. Otherwise, we're still going to be hurting. Sir, I mean, and I think that It'll be more of a matchup thing, too, because I do think that you would put House on Julio. I think that, you know, Calvin Johnson's not in the league anymore, but even like a Calvin Benjamin, um, Odell might end up with a quicker corner on him. But uh, as, as far I, as it sits now, I would be surprised if Green Bay really used a true number one corner and still had a little bit of success. But at the same time, you might be right. Maybe that's what exactly what they're missing. Zach, what are your thoughts going in with just the group that it is right now, knowing that there's likely going to be one or two rookies added to the crew? Well, like you mentioned earlier about Ladarius Gunter, I'm I'm pretty high on him too. I I, I really like his his athletic ability. I think you know, give him another off season under his belt, you know, at, learning as one of the top corners of the team, he'll he'll kind of hopefully take that leap. And as for Demarius Randall, Quentin Rollins. I, I, I pretty much this is this is kind of wishful thinking as well, but I have full confidence that they're going to make that jump. Their third year, like Devontae Adams did. I mean, they were playing Randall and Rollins both were playing through groin injuries midway through the season. They're both pretty much banged up all down the stretch. Uh, I, I think if they can just stay healthy, they're going to be major contributors in their third season. And Devon House, I mean, yeah, we know we know what we're getting from him. We saw from 2011 through 2014. We saw what what Devon, uh, Devon, Devon House was. Now, as a veteran, he's going to, I believe, his seventh season. You know, think, things have kind of changed a little bit. He, he plays a lot better with uh, press man coverage, not zone, not off his receiver. He's, he's a bump and run guy, as he told uh, uh, Packers.com. He's a bump and run corner. So if Dom Cabers can just somehow kind of simplify his scheme a little bit, kind of not dumb it down, but make it so the younger guys can understand it a little easier, grasp the whole concept better, and you know Devon House can really thrive in his own in his own environment like that. But um, yeah, I, I, he's not going to be major improvement. I've said this before; he's not going to be the guy that turns the entire production of the corners a full one eighty degrees, and he's not going to lead the league in interceptions like you know that Casey Hayward guy. Um, but he, he he's gonna. He's going to be a pretty good lift to to that secondary, and he, his experience adds a whole other aspect to it. So that's that's going to be pretty influential for the young guys as well. Talk to me about your guy Josh Hawkins before we move on to the 
move on to the uh, the next group here. We evaluate the rookies because you and I are both in on this kid. Yeah, I was I was hoping you'd ask me about him, uh, Josh Hawkins, man. He, I said this last off season, he has a lot of similarities to Sam Shields. I mean, the the the, the three cone, the forty yard dash, the his the the size in general, and you know, both being undrafted. Josh Hawkins, he obviously struggled last season in the limited time he got against the Lions. Gave up that big play to Marvin Jones, I believe, right before the half. He didn't really see much time. He's, he's really been limited to just special special teams since then. But, you know, if he can also kind of pick things up this offseason, I think he can also not take take a leap. But he can he can provide some good depth at the bottom of the depth chart for the Packers. I'm not saying he's going to come in, you know, be some starter. Uh, but he definitely gives some pretty good depth right there. And the Packers are, I'm not saying they're lucky to have him, but they're pretty lucky to have him. I, he, he, he's, a, he's a pretty good corner as far from uh, his measurable show, but he's yet to show that on the field, so we'll see. Cody, did you have a chance to scout Josh Hawkins at all? I didn't. In fact, my viewing of him is pretty limited just to when he was thrusted into our lineup, so I couldn't speak uh, too highly one way or the other other than just from what uh, you, know, you read on uh, from around camp and all that kind of stuff, but you know, there's no doubt that there's some young, talented guys that they made roster spots for and are excited about. You know, going in the future. I mentioned Whit before; he's a good coach. There's, a, I mean, Shields didn't come into the league a number one guy. You know, he was coached up. You know, transferred from wide receiver. I think, you know, there's certainly guy uh, Whit, certainly a guy that can make guys good corners. Yeah, and you know, I mean, you know, he's got to be frustrated because his group. You know, anything you read about. And, and those guys do read stuff. <laughs> they, they'll tell you they don't, but they do. Um, you know, every, everything you look at as far as draft needs, it's his group. His group is what the team needs. Um, everybody, you know, is, is mocking a corner to them in the first two rounds. And, and he knows that he's got uh, two first-round picks or two, two top two-round picks in his position group that he's not – you know that he hasn't gotten what the team needs out of those two guys because he's he's used to doing it with pitch and bailing wire. He's used to doing it with undrafted Sam Shields and undrafted cut from the Texans Jermon Williams, and and he's used to making something out of nothing. And they gave him something, and and it was kind of nothing. So I can understand where where Wit certainly would have some uh, some very serious frustration about everything that went on this season. It would be. As, as is the rest of the team, motivated to try and get back to another Super Bowl. So uh, let's let's dive into the draft, though. That's what the people come here for. That's what we want to do. We're going to ask the same questions as we always do. Um, but I'm going to kind of probably skip this one because we're basically all going to say that we'd be pretty comfortable with a corner in round one, correct? That's, yeah, that's, that's debatable. Well, debate it then because I think you and I might – Give me your reasoning, and I'll give me why I might probably agree with you. Well, I'm, I'm no, uh, I'm no draft expert like our guy Cody over here, but I, I do know this is a pretty deep class of corner. So if the Packers do happen to pass on one in the first round, and you know by some chance go best player available, like Ted Thompson is known for doing, they can afford to do that, and they can grab a, cor- a corner in the second, third round, and that that's definitely a possibility. Because, like I said, it's a very deep class this year. Not just that corner, but defensively. See, and that's why I think I potentially agree with you. Because, um, I, I, I mean, I've said that there are 10 first-round quality corners in this draft. Our guy, Vach Lombardi, I don't know if you listened to that show or have paid attention to any of his stuff. He's pretty fantastic. Uh, he said there are 12 guys that he wouldn't be mad. Not, not projecting 12 to go, but just that there are 12. And, and so if you feel like there are 12 first-round corners, you know, you, you can take an edge defender. Uh, you can take a luxury pick at, at wide receiver or, you know, he won't, but like O.J. Howard. Uh, you can take a, the best player in the first round and still get a corner. I would like them to take a pass rusher in the first round and a corner in the second. Uh, Cody, you, you, you seem to think they're really missing that number one corner, though. Yeah, I would be more than thrilled if they took one in the first, uh, particularly just because that would lead me to believe that they had this, their eyes targeted on this guy. 
Um, it was in a different tier, you know what I mean? Like, we're talking about how, yes, at 61, there could potentially be one of the, I'd say, top 13 guys for me who would come in and compete right away to start. So that is a great, great depth. So, you know, you could risk one taking one at uh, waiting until 61 or maybe even playing a, a trade-up scenario. But the idea that if they took one at 29, that guy must be on a tier above the rest of those guys, you know, you know, and debating taking him or, or waiting. So uh, I would be fine with taking one of 13 guys in the first round at DB um, for one reason or the other. So uh, I understand what you guys are saying with the depth and waiting and getting away with it, but I would have no issues in, in the first. So, Cody, you would want one um... – you would want one in the in the um, the sixty though, right? The top sixty. Definitely. I don't. I think if you, I mean, it would depend on who is going to be around in the third round. But it would be great to put my head on my pillow at the end of Friday, knowing that they have got the cornerback position. All right. So and let's talk about that top sixty then. Let's talk about first or second round guys. Uh, Cody, give us some popular names in, in, that will be drafted by the end of uh, let's let's just say like the end of the or the end of the middle. Let's say off the off the board before Green Bay picks in the third round for sure. Off the board before they're picking round three. Okay, well, and I'll even narrow it down to guys I think that they would target. Uh, although most of those guys would be those guys that they that they look at, uh, which are generally five eleven and over. Over 200 pounds or 195 to 200 pounds generally. Fast three cone, short shuttle. They want quickness. They need speed on defense. So I think Marshawn Latimer from Ohio State. Is, um, I wouldn't say there's a big time consensus as his as him in the number one spot, but a lot of people have him in the number one corner. Uh, he's a really good, talented young guy from Ohio State. Has some hammy issues, but uh, he can flat out fly. Uh, you know, definitely has the look of a potential lockdown. I think his teammate. Uh, Jerry Conley helped himself quite a bit at the combine. He came in and tested extremely well. He's got a lot of length to him, uh, over six foot. Uh, he wasn't quite as heralded as Lattimore, I'd say, this past season, but he has uh, some really impressive tape. Uh, another guy is Marlon Humphrey from Alabama. Uh, he, again, another guy with you know has great size, is really willing as a run defender, can lay the wood. Uh, he does have trouble finding the ball. Uh, he, He's given up his share of big plays, which I know is kind of cringeworthy, but uh, he's got good bloodlines and, and he's a hell of an athlete, you know, learning cornerback position. And, you know, Alabama, for what they are, you know, they do put a lot of decent corners in the NFL. Ohio State is becoming really DBU, too, that we're going to talk about a lot. Uh, third round, or excuse me, second round, Kevin King. Uh, he's the teammate of Sidney Jones, more heralded probably corner from there, but uh, Kevin King is on right. Talking about combine, he had one of the most impressive workouts of any corner in the last five years. Again, another long guy, 6'3". Uh, he plays to his length extremely well. Uh, and he's uh, a willing tackler, I would say, but he's not exactly a great one. But he, he knows how to be physical and uh, with some proper technique coaching, he could be really good. He's that, that good of an athlete. A couple more guys. Sorry if I'm going to hammer these all out on you, but you know, it's in a, a position that I've definitely delved into quite a bit. Um, Jadobi Awuzi from Colorado, a guy who can play on the inside, on the outside, uh, decent run support, gets his hands on a lot of footballs. He's uh, kind of a more of a versatile piece, I'd say, than just the guy you plug in the slot or just on the outside. I think you can move him around, uh, you know, kind of similar to a Micah Hydro, which you know probably entices the Packers uh, at this point. I think, you know, if, if they decided to take him in the first, I think we could talk ourselves into it. He's probably more of a second-round player. I think Fabian Moreau, uh, Ross, this is your guy. So mm-hmm. I you can delve into him a little bit more, but uh, a super fast guy, uh, plays the ball well. I think, uh, you know, he helped himself quite a bit this offseason. And the last guy I'll mention, uh, who I think is more of a third round player, but could go as high as a second, I've done no problems, uh, is a Keller uh, Witherspoon from Colorado, a Ruzi's teammate. Again, another really long guy like Kevin uh, King. He plays the ball really well. He can wrap his uh, arms around defenders. Um, he knows how to play the football. I think he's a really talented young guy as well. But, you know, right there, those are guys that just kind of fit the mold of what Thompson looks for at the cornerback position. And we have uh, seven, eight guys within the first two, three rounds, I think, are all really good options for them to draft. And, then, and I missed one. I'm sorry, Quincy Wilson from Florida, one of my favorite guys. 
Uh, he, he does have the look a little bit of a safety. He's a bigger, thicker guy. But again, uh, was really stout in pass protection. In fact, guys weren't even really targeting his side of the field, going after his teammate more. Uh, I think he could be a potential pick in the first. Well, all right. So who's your favorite guy out of that group? I mean, I guess I would just go. I think Conley fits most of what we're looking for, uh, what Green Bay likes. Physical at the line, good length, and uh, and can play the run. And there's a slight realistic possibility he could drop down there. Um, but, again, Ohio State guys are coming in really, really good. Uh, Roby, uh, Roby and uh, Apple, they both stepped in and played well right away. So I, there could be something there where you know, guys are thinking Urban Meyer, Coach Gup guys are, are coming in ready. So I, there's a chance he might be there, a chance he might not. But I think he probably fits most what we're looking at. Zach, who is your favorite corner that's kind of being mocked in the top 60. I actually share your view that uh, Fabian Moreau kid out of UCLA, he's uh, he's really caught my eye. His speed, his 4-3 speed above all else is what stood out to me. I, uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him fall to Green Bay. Yeah, it fits a lot of things. You know, the height, ball skills, he, he really can be a star, I think, whereas Conley's more of a shutdown guy. Um, he, Conley's passer rating against last year was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I think, you know, if, if you feel like your playmakers are going to be ha-ha, Rollins and Randall, the guys that you're going to have attacking the ball, because even as bad as Randall was last year, he was still always around the ball making plays. Um, maybe you do just take Conley, who would, would end up being a rich man's Devon House, where he might not intercept 10 balls his whole career, but he's going to take away other guys, you know, or other team's top receivers. That's certainly something that's possible. But, yeah, Moreau is kind of my crush. Um, a lot of that, though, admittedly had to do with him early on in the pre-draft process being like a third or fourth-round pick and me looking at the tape and being like, no, that's that's not how that should go. And, and lo and behold, after a big combine, that's certainly not, not the way um, – that it's going to go. So uh, we'll skip the next point here because you know, we talk about uh, best player, period. Well, we are already talking about um, you know the, the, the top of the line. We're not looking for mid-round picks. We want one, want one early. Quick question, Cody, on T's Tabor. How far down your board did he drop after the combine? You know, I didn't have my cornerbacks listed, but, you know, from somebody who was talked about in that first tier, on the lower end of the first tier, he firmly put himself down, down in towards the second. Uh, you know, the tape doesn't lie, and, you know, ultimately that is the go-to. But when you see a bad testing like that at the combine, you know, he's running high four fives and um, not looking as sharp as he should be, you go back and you do see some of those inconsistencies on film. Uh, you know, the slow, long speed, the long, slow, long speed, uh, some of the quick tips, uh, quickness, but he does have great ball skills. He is physical. Uh, he played damn good for two years out there. So, you know, it's hard to just completely write him off because he tested so poorly. He could have just been having a bad day or, you know, pro day will be, mean a lot to him. But uh, I think, you know, definitely down in the second tier, uh, more of a second round guy, second to third round guy, as opposed to the fringe first, second round. So, you know, about a round or so. All right, that's that's certainly fair. Uh, Cody, who's the most underrated corner in this class? Boy, underrated. Um, you know, some guy that I know that uh, uh, Jacob would love if I gave a shout-out to would be Jordan Lewis from Michigan. Yep. He's a guy that's not really on my radar or any, any Packer drafts radar because, you know, he measured in at five foot ten, and that's just kind of below the threshold of of what the Packers look at, but, you know, all Big Ten two years in a row, uh, fantastic uh, guy to play the ball in the air, can get after in the run game. He really was a do-it-all slot outside guy for Michigan for a while. I, I think he's kind of being overlooked and just picked just as a slot guy where, you know, he could have, end up having a decent career playing both outside and inside, and I think in a, on day two someone's going to get actually themselves a really good cornerback who just doesn't exactly measure up to what Thompson likes out of his corner. 
Zach, the most underrated corner in the class. Most underrated. Uh, honestly, I wouldn't be able to give you an answer about that. That's uh, that's Cody's territory. I'm not, but I'm not a super draft expert, but uh, yeah, I definitely couldn't answer that one. No problem. No like, problem. Let's go with two guys that I, I kind of got picked in the late rounds that I think uh, would appeal to Thompson and Witt and uh, Capers. And, uh, Shaquille Griffin from Central Florida just tested extremely well, raw athlete. And I think Brandon Langley from Lamar uh, was normally a, came out of the high school as a really high recruit to Georgia and ended up uh, deciding to transfer. But again, just a physical specimen to work with. Uh, you know, bounced around from position to position a little bit. Uh, I think those are two guys that you can look at in the sixth, seventh round or possibly undrafted free agent and you know bring them in and kind of bring them along the way of Hawkins and some of the other younger guys. If if they're undrafted, you can almost bet they'll end up in Green Bay. For sure. Uh, one of the two, I'll talk about a couple of guys here. These guys I really think that are underrated. One is Cordray Tankersley from Clemson. I really liked his tape. I thought that there were a lot of really good players on that Clemson team, and he kind of got overlooked a little bit. But athletically, he fits right in with what Thompson generally drafts. Uh, Jordan Lewis, I tell you who would be a rich man's Micah Hyde, same school, Desmond King. He's a really good player. Um, I would not have a problem playing him at slot zone outside, probably not man-to-man -man against a, a, a really fast wide receiver, but a guy I think could pair with HaHa -Ha to, you know, really give a good look at safety if um, if they are going to use Morgan Burnett in more of a hybrid linebacker type of role. But yeah, Cordray Tankersley, Desmond King, and then Jordan Lewis. I mean, I'm definitely with, uh, I'm definitely with Cody on the Jordan Lewis thing. I think just because a guy's 5'10", um, doesn't mean that he, you know, he can't play ball. Speaking of, just because a guy's five ten doesn't mean he can't play ball. My guy, uh, the love of my life, Adoree Jackson from USC. I think he would be such an electric addition to the Packers. Uh, play him on defense. He he, he might get beat a, a, a little bit, which is really you know the big problem with with uh, Green Bay's corners is just giving up the big play, uh, especially for whatever reason up the right sideline, but. I think with with Mike Hyde leaving, you go from a chance to have a really a good punt returner to I think a Dory could be one of the best return men in the league and really does have a chance to be uh, a pretty good corner, especially if you protect him early in his career. So th those are kind of my guys: a Dory, Desmond King, Jordan Lewis, and and Cordray Tank Tankersley. As far as guys that I think are a little bit uh, undervalued. So guys, we we're all in agreement here. We've been talking all season about, or all off season about those first six picks in the first five rounds. That's where that comp pick goes in. There's there's a hundred percent chance the Packers take a corner in one of those first six picks, right? I would hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's sometimes a, a point of discussion, but just not this week because if uh, you know, unless they sometime between now and then sign. You know, Darrell Revis and uh, I don't even know who else is on the market, although I would not endorse that signing. But unless they sign, like, one or two more corners, I, I, I just would be absolutely shocked. So, Zach. I mean, they could, they could trade for Richard Sherman. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm not sure that's a, I'm not sure yeah, that's no, a scheme you. fit or really even a guy I want on the squad. Yeah, me either. But, uh, anyway. Zach, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, listeners, thank you for listening every week. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you want to check out my work, that's going to be at cheeseheadtv.com on Mondays and packerstalk.com on Fridays. Zach, where can they check you out? You can uh, find me at Cheesehead TV as well and on Twitter at Zach, Z-A-C-H-A, Jacobson, J-A-C-O-B-S-O-N. That's my handle. Cody, you're starting to crank out some content. Yeah, put out that nice big uh, comprehensive Thompson kind of uh, draft guide, if you would, looking at some of uh, his trends and stuff. I, I might be doing some scouting reports. I I'd like to get a mock draft out there. I know you do your Monday mock drafts, which are always a good read, and I know a lot of people read that stuff. Um, I might put together a nice big seven-rounder for the Packers and potentially even uh, just a, a give it a go at the top 32, but... Uh, yep, it's, 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 it's the season. It's going to creep up on us here. March is almost over, and, and April will be coming. Yeah, it's coming in hot. And 
Uh, speaking of coming in hot, so is the Cheesehead TV Draft Guide. There are a ton of talented uh, analysts, talented writers that work on that thing. It is the only piece of content that we charge for at Cheesehead TV. Everything else uh, is completely on the house, but it is worth it. I would put it up against literally any you know newsstand, grocery store, draft guide. But at the same time, this is designed for you, the Packers fan. I mean, that's why you're listening to this show. I would check it out. Pre-order price, six I'm not 100% sure when that bumps back up to eight ninety nine, but it will happen. So reserve your copy now. Thank you guys one more time, and go Pack Go.